good evening one and all in today's presentation we'll be talking about placental transfusion we'll be talking about what is the definition of placental transfusion what is the physiology behind the various benefits which you see with the placental transfusion what are the various types of placental transfusion which are available with us and finally evidence about its use in term and preterm babies placental transfusion is not something new in fact it was right there from the 19th century however this practice felt was left out of the use because of the various concerns the concerns regarding delayed uh, delayed cord clamping were that if we delay the umbilical cord clamping it may increase the risk of hemolytic disease in newborn leading to increased risk of jaundice phototherapy and double volume exchange transfusion we are always in a hurry to assess the baby and assign abgar scores many of our obstetrician colleagues they feel that keeping the cord intact will contaminate the sterile field and delaying cord clamping may increase transfer of anesthetics which are given to the mother and to the infant thereby causing more harm however there is no evidence to it and majority of the international bodies in the early 20th centuries came up with recommendations that we should clamp the cord early however in the wake of recent evidence of benefit now the evidence from all the international bodies and national bodies including acog nice guidelines recommend that we should delay cord clamping by 30 seconds or more so what is placental transfusion it is allowing that extra amount of blood which is there in the placenta to flow from placenta to the baby in the first few minutes of life it is usually of three types the most common one being delayed cord clamping the other one includes cord milking which is again of two types cut cord milking and uncut cord milking and last and the most recent one is the intact cord resuscitation that is where resuscitation is done with an intact cord now how is delayed cord clamping beneficial soon after birth with the clamping of the cord as we cut the umbilical vein and the artery there is increased systemic resistance that is increase after load for left ventricle and there is also increase after load for right ventricle because the lungs are still collapsed there is viso constriction of the pulmonary bed furthermore with the cutting of the umbilical vein there is decrease venous return to the right side of the heart which decreases the preload for the right side of the heart as well as to the left side of the heart because there is hardly any blood going to the lungs in view of increasing after load and decreasing preload there is decrease in the cardiac output as a result of which majority of the organs suffer from relative ischemia so if we delay the clamping of the cord there is extra amount of blood transfer from the placenta to the baby which goes to the right side of the heart it improves oxygenation the lung vasculature opens up there is increased blood flow to the lungs which in turn returns to the returns to the left atrium thereby increasing the preload of the left ventricle leading to better cardiac output we also know that placenta contributes almost 50% of the total blood volume in the premature babies or in mid gestation and as we reach term two third of the blood resides in the fetus and one third in the placenta so more premature the baby better is going to be the benefit besides these factors there are various other factors which make cord blood precious these includes that whatever blood we are transferring from placenta to the baby is at the body temperature so it prevents hypothermia it is well oxygenated it is a rich source of plasma proteins coagulation factors and it contains around 30 to 50 mg of iron which is enough to last for one year thereby decreasing incidence of anemia and iron deficiency in the first year of life it is also a rich source of source of stem cells which are used for tissue repair besides these it also contains numerous cytokines growth factors antioxidants and important messengers which are important for normal transition to take place now when should we clamp the cord the amount of transfer of blood from the placenta to the fetus is directly proportional to the delay we do in cutting the cord 
as can be seen in this diagram that is in the bars we have compared 5 seconds versus 1 minute versus 3 minute so we have seen that the blood volume is maximum when we cut the cord at 3 minutes compared to 1 minute which is in turn is more than cutting the cord at 5 seconds and same holds true for red cell volume that is the maximum red cell volume is transferred after 3 minutes compared to 1 minute and 5 seconds if we see the other side of this coin the amount of blood which is left in the placenta is least after delaying cord clamping by 5 minutes compared to 2 minutes which is in turn more than the immediate cord clamping in this diagram to the right if we compare delayed cord clamping at 5 minutes versus cord milking then we can see that it is the delayed cord clamping by 5 minutes which causes maximum transfer of blood to the baby now what are the factors which influence placenta transfusion these include uterine contractions that is whenever the uterine contracts there is increased gradient so whenever there is uterine contraction there is increased pressure in the uterus to the tune of 50 to 100 mhg and because of this increase gradient there is increased blood transfer during uterine contraction soon after birth the umbilical artery goes into the vasospasm which allows more blood to transfer from placenta to the fetus and very little or no amount of blood is transferred from fetus to the placenta the other factor which is very important is that if we delay the cord clamping by the time baby starts breathing of its own it leads to creation of negative intrathoracic pressure the negative intrathoracic pressure causes increased venous return to the left side of the heart and thereby increasing payload of the right ventricle which in turn causes increased blood flow to the, the lungs and increase preload to the left side of the heart resulting in better cardiac output the gravity has an important effect on transfer of this extra amount of blood from placenta to the baby if we keep the baby below the level of the placenta there is going to be more transfer of blood and more we delay clamping the cord more will be the blood transfer in this diagram to the right we can see that the maximum blood is transferred when the baby is held below the uterus with the help of gravity compared to the baby who is kept at the level of the placenta or below the level of, or above the level of the placenta coming to the benefits in term units because of the delayed cord clamping there is extra amount of transfer of 20 30 ml per kg of blood which increases the hemoglobin concentration at 2 to 3 days leading to better iron stores in the first year of life remember that iron deficiency in itself is a risk factor for impaired urodeletal outcome thereby by correction of anemia and correction of iron deficiency these babies are going to have better urodeletal outcome iron is also an important factor in formation and function of oligodendrocytes which are important for myelin formation and studies have shown that in babies in whom we delay umbilical cord cutting they have better myelin formation and improved fine motor and social behavior at 4 years of life further the support comes from the cochrane which was published in 2013 consist of around 4000 babies where they compared delayed cord clamping versus early cord clamping they showed that it did not increase any incidence of severe postpartum hemorrhage in mothers therefore it is safe for mothers there was no difference in neonatal mortality but there was increased incidence of iron deficiency and hemoglobin levels were low in babies who were randomized to early cord clamping delayed cord clamping has been studied more extensively in preterm babies and it has been shown to be associated with decrease in hospital mortality and it decreases mortality by 27% Coming to the long-term development outcome in premature babies, this was the recent trial which followed up these babies till 18 months. They recruited women with singleton fetus of less than 32 weeks of gestation, and they compared delayed clamping with milking to early cord clamping. 
and the outcomes they studied was IVH, late onset sepsis, and motor outcomes at 18 to 22 months. Uh, what they found was encouraging that delayed cord clamping was associated with better motor scores on Bailey scale, and it decreased the incidence of low scores by 78%, by 68%, although there was no difference in the incidence of severe IVH. Coming to the delayed cord clamping in situation, spatial situations, where initially we thought these situations as to be contraindications, but recent studies have shown that delayed cord clamping can be done in these situations and it is safe and useful. The first includes aluminization. There was previous concerns that delaying cord clamping may increase the risk of jaundice, need for phototherapy and double volume exchange transfusion. Many studies, including one from India, has shown that there is no difference in double volume exchange transfusion, jaundice, or need for phototherapy. In fact, RH isomerized babies in whom delayed cord clamping was done, they had better hematocrit at two, years, two hours of life. The other group is HG and LG babies. It was con again a concern that since these babies are predisposed to polycythemia and jaundice, delaying cord clamping may again increase the risk of jaundice and need for phototherapy. But again, we have shown that delayed cord clamping improves the iron stores without increasing the risk of jaundice or polycythemia. Similarly, in mothers with retroviral disease, delayed cord clamping has not been associated with increased transmission or risk of jaundice, but has been shown to decrease the incidence of anemia in these babies. So what are the contraindications to DCC? Frankly speaking, there is hardly any contraindication. Whatever, there are some relative contraindications to delayed cord clamping. The material indication includes severe hemorrhage, hemodynamic instability, or any form of antipartum hemorrhage like abrupt show or placenta previa. The fetal and the neutral indications include immediate resuscitation. As of now, we do not practice or uh, the intact cord resuscitation has not come into clinical practice. Or if there is disrupted placental circulation that is continued with the intact cord doesn't help in such situations like cord avulsion or IUGR babies with abnormal Dopplers. The other technique of placental transmission is cord milking where we have two types. One is the intact cord milking. That is the cord is left intact and then we do milking. After completion of milking, we cut the cord. The other form is where we cut the cord first and we take a long segment around 20 to 30 centimeters and after cutting, then we milk the cord from the placental end towards the baby. This cord milking is especially important in babies who require resuscitation because cord milking can be done within 10 to 20 seconds and therefore it does not interfere with resuscitation. So what is intact umbilical cord milking? Here, as you can see in the picture that the cord is still attached to the placenta and we milk the cord from the placental to the fetal end and this each step is done for two seconds and in between we have to allow the vessels to refill and then this procedure is repeated three to five times. What is cut umbilical cord milking is that we first cut a long segment of the umbilical cord 20 to 30 centimeters and then we clamp this cut segment of the cord from the placental towards the fetus end three to five times and this can be done along with the resuscitation. Now, which is better, the cut or the intact cord milking? If we compare the different lengths of cut umbilical cord, then the amount of blood which is transferred from placenta to the fetus is directly proportional to the length of the cut umbilical cord. That is, more the length, more is going to be the transfer of blood. Now, if we compare these two techniques, that is, cut cord milking versus intact cord milking, then the amount of blood transfer is more in intact cord milking. Now, can this umbilical cord milking be done in preterm babies? This was one of the landmark trials which uh, answered our query, and it was done by Katheri et al. in 2019. They recruited preterm babies less than 32 weeks of gestation. It had around 450 babies, and uh, the outcome they studied was a composite outcome of death and severe IVH. Uh, what they found was alarming that in babies who were randomized to umbilical cord milking, there was higher incidence of death or severe IVH. And when they considered severe IVH alone, it was also significantly high in babies who were randomized to umbilical cord milking. 
so this uh, after this trial the umbilical cord milking went into distress um, went out of the practice for babies who are premature especially those less than 29 weeks same findings were again shown in the recent trial which was done in al pw babies less than 29 weeks of gestation this trial again showed increased risk of mortality or severe ivh with umbilical cord milking in premature babies who are less than 29 weeks so umbilical cord milking as of now is not advised in premature babies especially those who are less than 29 weeks because of the increased risk of mortality and severe ivh some concerns although they are mostly theoretical with placental transfusion are over transfusion which leads to polycythemia and jaundice it has been feared that delayed cord clamping may lead to hypothermia pulmonary hypertension it may delay resuscitation or may increase the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage in mothers but all these concerns are in theory only and in practice no trial has shown that they happen in day to day practice with delayed cord clamping the third and the last form of placental transfusion is the intact cord resuscitation why is it important because majority of the trials which have come delayed with this early cord clamping they have excluded these babies who require resuscitation also we know that umbilical cord milking cannot be done in premature babies especially those less than 29 weeks so what next the next up upcoming technique of placental transfusion is intact cord resuscitation where without cutting the cord we proceed with the resuscitation and when we do this and we resuscitate these babies there is increased blood flow to the lungs which in turns it turns to the left side of the heart increases cardiac output it decreases the variation in the cerebral blood flow thereby decreases mortality as well as improves long term outcome now we know that placenta not only functions as a kidney but also it does the lung function for the fetus so allowing cord to remain intact during its gestation helps in improving oxygenation it helps in removing the co2 it also prevents hypoglycemia and we know that hypoglycemia in itself is a risk factor for impaired neurological outcome so once there is intact cord it provides a continuous supply of glucose to these babies and thereby improves their outcomes whether it is possible in our day to day setup yes it is possible there are many such trolleys one like one shown in the picture it's called a life start trolley which can in which we can resuscitate the baby on the mother's side without any problem these trolleys usually have inbuilt pulse oximeter blenders and tp resuscitator and they can be the length can be altered and they can be rotated 360 degree to allow for easy resuscitation at bed side now coming about the evidence of intact cord resuscitation this is the largest rct on this topic again it was done from, from one of the lmic countries and here the authors come they did the, the study in late preterm and term neonates and they compared intact cord resuscitation with early cord clamping the outcomes they studied were saturation heart rate and abgas at 1 5 and 10 minutes the results were encouraging um, they showed that the incidence of low abgas score saturation at 5 minutes saturation at 10 minutes were low in babies who were randomized to early cord clamping also there was high risk of an icu admission and mortality in babies who were randomized to early cord clamping compared to intact cord resuscitation although it was not statistically significant because of these benefits in intact cord resuscitation the cord had uh, this trial had to be stopped in between so what is the protocol of Uh, delayed cord clamping this is one of the mnemonics which can be used to remember that is d stands for you should communicate the team and start this practice in your nicu or hospital then should ensure that we have regular supplies it doesn't need any additional equipment we just need warm linen then we should assign roles we should have a time keeper one who keeps a watch on timing of cutting of umbilical cord then the time should be noted and it should be sh shouted clear to the team after every 15 seconds we should seek the support of the obg colleagues because without their consent and without their support this practice cannot reap benefits or it cannot be done then we have to ensure that 
the tra fetal transfusion period is complete that is the delaying is done from one to three minutes then we also have to stimulate in between if the baby is not crying and once we have stimulated the baby and baby starts crying we should stop and cut the cord at one to three minutes depends depending on your unit protocol and finally there should be ongoing evaluation of the baby what we do our in unit is that any term or preterm we counsel the parents and discuss the cord management with our ob colleagues because that is very important that is the first and the most important step for the success of delayed cord clamping so we assess the babies at birth if they do not require any resuscitation we delay clamping of the cord by one to three minutes depending on the gestation if the baby requires resuscitation then we do cord milking that is intact cord milking for babies who are more than 32 weeks we do not do cord milking in babies who are less than 32 weeks because the some of the trials have shown increased mortality and risk of ivh since this is the vulnerable group is less than 32 weeks so we try to avoid doing umbilical cord milking and we continue to evaluate these babies for the need of further resuscitation so what next so now we have no doubt that delayed cord clamping is beneficial both in term and preterm babies and umbilical cord milking is a useful alternative in more mature babies who are more than 32 weeks and depressed so what has to be answered in subsequent studies is not whether we should do early or delayed cord clamping but we should try to answer when to do delayed cord clamping because various international bodies give different recommendations for example acog lcor and aap recommend cutting the cord at 30 to 60 seconds whereas who says cut the cord after one minute rcog says cut it after two minutes and the american council of nursing and midwives say that we should cut it after two to five minutes so our next question should be not to say not to ask that whether we do early or delayed cord clamping but we should try to answer when to do delayed cord clamping in fact the delayed cord clamping is a misnomer misleading in fact it should be a physiological cord clamping rather than delayed cord clamping so my take home messages are that delayed cord clamping is safe and feasible it should be done routinely in all stable preterm and term babies Umbilical cord mil milking is a useful alternative for term units who require resuscitation, especially and preterm babies who are more than 32 weeks. Intact cord resuscitation is something which may be a future norm, and umbilical cord milking should not be done in premature babies who are less than 29 weeks because it has been associated with increased mortality and IVH. Thank you.